So welcome everyone that's tuning in tonight. We have quite an audience showing up and I'm really pleased to see that. Um, tonight we're doing something we haven't done in a while, which is a legislative update. We have, um, we've invited several folks and we got two to say yes. And, and uh, Representative Julie uh, Von Hafen and Senator Wiley Nickel. And we're so proud to have them here because we, you know, a lot of people want to know we're getting ready to go back into to the session on January 14th. And so we have a lot of people asking, so what got done, what's still left on the table and so forth. But before I say too much about that, I, I would just want to make sure I introduce you slightly in case you don't know these um, two uh, elected officials. Um, Julie is an attorney. She has three children in the public school system. She was elected uh, a cycle ago. Uh, before that, uh, Julie was very well known in Wake County as a PTA, uh, Wake County PTA Council President. She served for the North Carolina PTA Board of uh, Directors. She has been working as a guardian ad litem in Wake County. So she's had a lot of uh, exposure to a lot of issues in Wake County and is well known um, throughout the community. And of course, you see here where she um, comes here um, from Ohio, where she got her undergraduate degree, and she also got her law degree from Case Western Reserve University. So, um, Wally, uh, I didn't, I jumped, I jumped, excuse me. Um, <laughs> Senator Nickel is also an attorney uh, from representing Cary, North Carolina, the area. He lives there with his wife, who, Caroline, also an attorney, and their two children. Um, uh, he started off with a political science degree, and then as Julie went on to law school at Pepperdine uh, University School of Law. Um, in the state senate, he's worked very strongly on public education, so has Julie, um, and pushing for issues around gerrymandering, affordable health care, and our environment. But both of these um, outstanding um, young citizens um, are doing a great job tonight because they've agreed to spend some of their evening that they could be with their families. Uh, talking to us. So we're very appreciative of that. And one of the things I asked them to do was to maybe share with us a little bit about what has gotten passed so far this year um, and to tell us a little bit about the bill uh, and its impact on education. So everything tonight we're talking about, a lot of bills uh, came uh, across their desk, but we're asking them to really look at K-12 and the things that affect, impact K-12. So Julie, if you don't mind, I'd like you to start off with talk, looking a little bit about what's been going on in the House. Okay, great. Well, um, thanks, Yvonne, and Public Schools First for having us on tonight. Um, I think you mentioned before, but we, you know, recessed uh, the long session back in November. Um, so we have been off for a couple months, but we're going back a week from today. So uh, I think this is good timing just to kind of recap what happened in 2019. And um, so I just first, I'm going to cover some things that passed that started, bills that started in the House and actually made it all the way through um, the House and the Senate and were signed by uh, Governor Cooper. So the first bill was HB 75, and I have my notes here. So if I look like I'm reading, that's because I am, because <laughs> a lot of these things happened a long time ago. And so it's sometimes hard to remember all the details, but. HB 75 was around school safety, and it was actually a bill that passed unanimously both in the House and the Senate. So this was a pretty non-controversial bill. It was based on, uh, there was a study that was done by the General Assembly around school safety. You know, of course, that's something that we're all very concerned about because of the gun violence in our schools. So although it didn't cover everything that I think it could have, it did set up some good things um, for uh, to help our, our safety in our schools here in North Carolina. So one of them was um, it required a census of officers in each public school and a collection of information about those officers, their education, their training, um, where they're located in the school, you know, if they're assigned to different grades, um, the school type that they're assigned to. And I think that's just to help, um, you know, us, the DPI, get a better understanding of what school resource officers are actually out there in our schools, because I don't think that was really done before. So it was hard to get a grip on, um, you know, how many school resources officers were even out there working. 
Um, it also requires the report of the percentage of officers um, assigned if they're assigned to more than one school, so, because some schools share resource officers. Um, it establishes a grant program to help fund officer recruitment, training, or both, and the schools have to apply for that funding. The funds are matched um, $2 for every, or what, for every $1 local, it'll match $2 of state funding. So obviously there's a need out there in the community, probably in some of our school districts that don't have a lot of money to hire resource officers, and this is a grant program to help those schools. Um, it also requires a report on the total number of school mental health personnel in each school unit. That report has to be submitted no later than March 15th of every year. And um, unfortunately, though, this bill did not fund any more mental health staff, um, which was, you know, to me, it was one of the big shortfalls of the bill. Um, we need so many more mental health staff across our state. And I hope that this reporting requirement in this bill will help us realize that and it will, you know, show the stark need that we have here in North Carolina for more mental health professionals in our schools. Uh, Representative, let me ask you a quick question on that. Yeah. When the mental health uh, people you're counting, would that be social workers, counselors, psychologists? I believe so. I think it's everyone in the school providing mental health services. A so nurse, a nurse might to be okay. Um, I, think I think so. Yeah, yeah I, can, I think it's I, exciting. Uh, having a good census of what's going on is something that's been missing. Yeah, and I, I can follow up just to confirm that. Um, that is a good question. That I'm not how I don't know exactly how they defined mental health professionals. So we'll we'll find out that for you for you guys. Um, the next one was HB 924. Um, this was a bill that was a little bit more controversial. Um, it's around requiring uh, the civic literacy, economics, and personal finance credit. The bill was actually entitled something about teacher contracts. So it did involve um, changing the length of new teacher contracts. Um, so that was kind of the, you know, sometimes bills are called something and then a lot of other things get stuck into it. And I think that this requirement around the economics and personal finance credit was stuck into this teacher contract bill. So under this bill now, the State Board of Education is going to require a full credit course of economics and personal finance before people can graduate from high school. It basically restructures civic education requirements that instruct students on the importance of voting, which is good, um, and staying informed on current events and governmental structures. But really the requirement around economics and personal finance was controversial because that's really already taught in our high school classes. And this will, re, you know, under, uh, and it will take away, potentially take away history credits, um, you know, that are now required to fit in this additional class. Um, I Did personally voted no on this. Go ahead. Did this have the support of our of the teacher association? Did they feel like this was a good thing to do? Do you remember uh, anything about that? I don't believe so. I think NCAE was against this bill. I personally voted against this bill. I don't think that if we listen to teachers, especially high school teachers, this is something that they feel is not necessary and is already mm -hmm. really being covered. So um, mm -hmm. unfortunately it did pass, you know, the General Assembly and, and the governor did, I can't, I think, I. I don't know for sure. I think he signed it. Some bills, um, you know, take go into effect as law if, if the governor just doesn't do anything. So I'd have to go back and look if he actually signed it. I don't know if Wiley, if you know, or remember. Yeah, I think I think he signed it. Yeah. Okay. I couldn't remember or not. So um, the next one, I know that, you know, I don't want to take up all the time here, but the next one was uh, HB 362. And this was a bill that revised the way that school performance grades are written. Um, before this bill, they were on a 10 point scale. Um, you know, when a school is given a grade, you know, A, B, uh, C, D, or F, um, before it was 90 to 100, you know, just like a regular test score. But now a school can score 85 or greater and get an A. Uh, a B would be 85 to 70, C 70 to 55. So it did help, um, you know, 
personally, like school performance grades, I, I am against those um, because they really are a reflection of poverty levels in schools and not really the performance levels of schools. But it, this is an improvement um, mm -hmm. to what we had before. Mm -hmm. So I did personally, I voted in favor of the bill just because it did help. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I hope that we can do some more work on school performance grades um, and revise those even more. Mm -hmm. um, the next one was around um, HB 377 was um, around um, principal recruitment supplements. Um, it did provide um, those supplements of 30000 a year for any qualifying principal that contracts with a low performing school. So I think this is to help principals be recruited into schools that, you know, need um, really great leadership. And this will provide some extra incentive financially for them to be there. So those are the bills that did pass. And I think we're going to talk about some that didn't pass that we mm -hmm. wish that did in a little bit. Okay. Um, and, and then it, for for the Senate, you know, the, the first one here, uh, SB 354, that really is the main bill. That's what we've been talking about all year. That's really the the, the meat of, of everything that we've done in the legislature all year, um, how much we invest in, in public education and our teachers. Th th this is a bill that uh, dealt with mainly with teacher pay. I voted against it. The governor vetoed it, and uh, it has not been overridden. It would have given teachers uh, an average of 3.9% for a raise, 55% of teachers uh, would receive no additional increase beyond the experience step. 45% of teachers would receive a minimal increase with the bill. Um, you know, we 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 have plenty of money to do this, and and that really is is the debate. So, you know, for for me, just speaking for myself, you know, I, I would rather invest, you know, in our our kids and our schools, and you know, in recruiting and retaining great teachers than giving tax cuts to corporations. So that that really is sort of the 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 budget argument here, but but this is this is what we'll we will be talking about uh when we're back on January 14th, uh, a week uh, today's Tuesday, a week from today, we'll be back in session uh and I'm hopeful that we'll reach a compromise on this, but you know, we could have done that back in June and we still haven't. And for me it was just really difficult for any teachers there to go and visit them and visit schools you know and have teachers who haven't received any any extra compensation that they should have gotten back in july you know and we're still here in, in january having ha, not having solved that issue so that's a big thing and you know i know we'll we'll talk a lot about this sort of in the leandro part a little later too um next one senate bill 343 this was a, a pretty non-controversial bill uh, it makes changes to various education report, reports, including date changes, repeals of certain reports, and modification of information to be reported. This this is kind of along the lines of just stuff that everybody agrees is, is a needed um, minor change in, in education policy. It passed unanimously in the Senate. I, I would imagine about the same in the House. Um, Senate Bill 219 is, is again in that bucket of, of bills that are non-controversial, you know, um, minor changes. This made various changes related to testing to the initial professional teacher licensure statutes, IPL, creates a one-year IPL extension for certain teachers, created a new limited teaching license for individuals who do not meet the criteria for a continuing professional license and for out-of-state teacher licenses. Nothing, nothing especially um, big there. And then the next one, Senate Bill 522, and this is kind of what Julie was talking about. When the governor doesn't really like a bill, uh, and but he's not going to quite veto it. A way he can kind of say, "I don't really like this," is by by letting it become law without his signature. So this is a bill that passed the Senate. Uh, I voted against it mainly because it dealt with uh, innovative school districts. You know, just just as a general policy for me, they, these this allows the state to seize lower performing schools and often allows private for profit companies to come in and take them over. And I, I'm just fundamentally against that. So. That was that was one that uh, I was against, but it, it did pass, and the governor, you know, had a lot of issues with it, but felt that overall there was some some benefit to it. So those are the those are the, the Senate bills that that uh, that passed. Okay, so let's let's stop. That's really good. So it sounds like it was a mixed bag, but uh, there were some pretty good uh, improvements uh, on all of those bills, and uh, so I think that's um, a win. 
for public education advocates that we see some things get a little better. Now let's talk a little bit about some of these bills that did not make it and maybe some of them shouldn't have or maybe there's some that will show up again. So uh, a lot of people in our audience um, ask that question a lot when a bill uh, uh, passes or doesn't pass, you know, once it doesn't pass, is it dead? Um, can it come back again? Or, and how does it come back again? Or is it just over for this session? So maybe when you're answering, looking at these house bills, Julie and Wally, you can talk a little bit about the process. Yeah. So um, in the General Assembly, there's something called crossover. So a bill has to cross from one chamber to the other by a certain date for it to be able to keep moving in the process. So I don't know. Um, you know, I didn't look up whether some of these met crossover or not, but if if the bill involves appropriations, then it can't, it doesn't, it's not subject to crossover. So a lot of these bills do have some appropriations in them. So that would mean that it could be heard um, in the short session or it is still alive, so to speak. But if it doesn't involve any appropriations or, or finance or money, basically, then it can't be heard if it didn't meet that crossover deadline. So um, the ones, all the bills in the House that I, these are just some of the ones, you know, that we filed regarding education in the House that um, did not go anywhere and didn't pass during the session in 2019. Um, personally, I mean, I think the biggest one that I I wish that would have been passed is HB 241, which is around, you know, the education construction bonds, which are so desperately needed in our state. Um, this, this bill passed the House on almost unanimously. Um, this is a bill that, you know, even Speaker Moore is very, um, or he was <laughs> at the time, very, um, you know, favorable toward. Um, I don't know, some of you all out there might have heard that there was some, you know, um, disagreement, I guess I would say, between Speaker Moore and Senator Berger around construction bonds and how we're going to pay for education, um, you know, uh, construction in our state. And in the House, and, and we believe that these bonds are really the best way to, to pay for those. So this bill, would have um, you know allowed 1.9 billion dollars worth of education uh, construction bonds. It would have given 1.5 billion for public school facilities through grants um, for you know capital outlay projects like new construction or land purchases or technology acquisitions. It would have given 200,000 to community colleges for repairs and renovations and 200,000 dollars to UNC which isn't really a lot in the grand scheme, but that billion dollars for public schools was really needed. So this um, bill is sitting in, it did make crossover because it did pass the House, but it's sitting in the Rules Committee in the Senate, which Wiley can tell you is probably means it's never gonna come out of that committee. <laughs> Um, so the next one is around restoring master's pay to teachers. This is one we hear a lot about from teachers and, and education advocates that, you know, master's pay was taken away from teachers um, in, I think Yvonne probably knows, 2015? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 20, 2015. So um, this would have, um, you know, restored that pay and, you um, it was referred, the bill was just basically referred to Appropriations Committee and never heard from again. So obviously the leadership in the House had no interest in hearing this bill and it basically has died. Um, the next one is um, a bill uh, to, re this is a bill I actually was the primary sponsor on, was restoring um, state employee medical benefits for retirees. Um, that was taken away um, back in 2017, I believe. Um, so now, uh, you know, any new hires um, after, uh, I believe it was, it's now, I believe, right? After January 1st, 2020? 2021. Um, 2021, okay. So if you're hired after that, you're, you're not gonna receive medical benefits after you retire. 
Um, so this would have restored that. Again, this bill was referred to a committee and never heard from again. So this was another one that there's not much interest in talking about. Let me ask you a quick question because you, you hit on something that um, we hear a lot about uh, on the folks that correspond with us. And they're very concerned about what they think is a, a decade old trust. That there's always been kind of a trust between um, funders, elected officials, and the teaching community in that, so we don't have the greatest pay schedule, but we have good or decent benefits. And there has always been a, a, an implied, you know, we'll work for a little bit less, but, but with, because we know that when we retire, we'll have a good retirement, we'll have health care. So now we're not gonna have health care for new teachers starting next year uh, when they retire. So how do you think this is going to impact the teacher pipeline or do you think that ha you know that'll have any impact? Uh, I mean absolutely. I mean the thing is that if you go into teaching, you know, now and you, you think that it's going to be your lifelong career, which I think most teachers think that. I mean they most teachers I talk to, you know, this is like a calling for them, you know. I mean this is something that they've wanted to do since they were you know, children, and I think most teachers intend to stay with it until they retire. And the thing is, you know, if I went and interviewed at a private company, for example, like at SAS or something, and they said, well, we'd love for you to come here, but we're not going to give you any retirement. We're, we're not going to give you retirement benefit. You'd be like, oh, well, I'll just go to another company, right, that offers that. And so we, as a teaching profession, you know, we have to look at ourselves just like a private company. I mean, we're out there competing for the best, you know, talent, um, the best people. And if we can't compete by offering those benefits, then we're going to lose out and people aren't going to want to go into teaching. So I think it's that's why I filed the bill, because I hear that a lot from teachers. And, you know, we hear a lot from state uh, employee like the retiree organization for state employees and this is one of their big issues too so it's a huge okay. thing yeah thanks for thanks for answering that that follow-up yeah um the next one that we didn't see any movement on was hb 482 which would have increased school psychologist compensation and recruitment like we just talked about with school safety this is a huge need you know in our state um we have to do better at recruiting and, and making it easier for schools to hire school psychologists. This bill would have provided um, recurring funds to implement a bonus program for school psychologists. And meaning if they would basically, they would receive a bonus if they agreed to remain employed in the school for three to five years. And so I think it's really um, looking at the fact that if we even if we hire a psychologist, we need to make sure that they're staying and they're staying long term, because if we're having a constant rotation of psychologists, they, they can't make those connections with kids. You know, you need to establish these long term relationships. And so we need to give them these grants and these bonuses to be able to stay and and, and establish those relationships. Again, so this is a good example of the private market, right? The, the private market yeah. for psychologists is very good. Uh, there's a shortage yeah, I mean, of it, psychologists in the private market and they pay very well. So we. Right. I mean, I. I know a couple of school psychologists that left to start their own private practice because it's like they can they their their clientele will be filled up, you know, with all these kids that then now they have to pay, you know, to go out outside of school. Whereas, you know, if they would have stayed, then they could really help a lot more kids that, you know, maybe can't pay for it on their own dime. Um, this is another bill that was referred to committee and never heard from again. These are all great ideas and obviously things that we need, but are not moving at all in the house. Um, another huge issue that you know we hear a lot about is around $15 minimum wage for non-certified school employees. Um, this is a big issue I know for NCAE. Um, they represent all these people as well as teachers, you know, that work in our schools. Here in Wake County, I'm lucky because our local school board and um, county commissioners, you know, were able to provide that $15 minimum wage through local funding. Now that, you know, by providing this local funding, it's again, it's seriously creating these huge, um, you know, 
differences between all of our school districts here in North Carolina because Wake County can afford to do that, but you know the next county over can't. That's why at our state level we have to give these people a living wage. I mean, it's and when I think about you know our cafeteria workers and our bus drivers, I mean these these workers are the people that our students are seeing on a daily basis. You know they're so important to our schools. I mean, bus drivers are are huge. You know, I put my three kids on a bus every day. They, they get on I-40 to go downtown. I want somebody who's going to care about them and love them and, and you know, keep them safe. And I want to pay them what they deserve. And so this is one that I am, I am passionate about. Again, this bill was referred to appropriations and never heard from again. Um, and so it's very disappointing. Um, and of course, the last one is the governor's budget, which we all know, um, it actually did pass the house because <laughs> it didn't pass the house or it did pass the house and then we unfortunately the veto was overridden in the house and now it's sitting in the senate so maybe wiley can talk about that yeah yeah um you know we're we're voting on the the budget veto override on uh next tuesday most likely or or at some point if if the uh republicans don't have the votes you know i think we won't vote on it so um, but it's still out there. Uh, on the, the Senate bills, you know, you had talked about um, master's pay for teachers. You know, there's two two bills here. The first one was was a bipartisan bill with, which is, you know, I was pretty encouraged. This this is a very early a bill filed very early on, with um, enough Democrats and Republicans to pass the Senate if it had come to a vote. But it went to the Rules Committee and and you know and, and hasn't gone anywhere. But the the one thing with master's pay, I think that's really important for everybody. Is is this is the, the that first bill SB 28 was um, seven million a year. That, that's that's all it takes to to restore master's pay. That's that's just budget dust. It, it is it is just <laughs> you know like this 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 much of the budget. Um, and so maybe you know maybe that's something that if we can get a compromise budget you know comes back to life. I, I certainly hope it will. You know there's there's enough support I think in in probably both chambers for it to pass if it can come to a vote. Um, in Senate Bill 93, you know, I filed along with Senator Chaudhry and Searcy a Wake County calendar flexibility bill. Uh, that one, um, we heard maybe that the House was gonna was considering this these bills a little bit, but but nothing nothing happened um, in the Senate on this. So we'll, we will keep, you know, in, in Wake County at least, we'll, we'll keep filing these bills um, until they pass. But but we, you know, we certainly think we ought to be able to sync up our calendars with community colleges if, if we want to. Um, and then the last Wiley, one. Wiley, let me Wiley, ask you. I, yeah. Go ahead. Wiley, go ahead, Julie. Please. I was just going to say, like, Wake County was not the only um, delegation that filed these types of bills. Many school districts yeah. filed these bills, and I, you know, you didn't list all the different ones, but there's obviously a statewide need and desire to have school calendar <laughs> flexibility um, because these bills are being filed all over the state you know on behalf of their school districts so i just wanted to mention that that this isn't a wake county issue it's really all over and let's talk and let's just back up for one second and make sure the audience understands when we talk about school calendar flexibility it's really like when schools can start each year and giving right. uh, school districts the opportunity to do what they think is best in their school district for uh, uh, academic progress by their students. And it also, uh, and one example of it is what Wiley said, which is some school districts would like to sync up and start the same time universities and colleges and community colleges do, so they can have the same break periods, but also for kids who take dual enrollment kids who are like in community college and high school at the same time and those kind of things. So a lot of parents and a lot of teachers have said it makes better sense for us to, um, for kids getting jobs and doing internships, you know, in businesses. And with the increased um, uh, interest in career tech in high school and cross training and uh, dual degrees across community colleges and high schools, we hear a lot of parents say this doesn't make sense that we are, are forced by the state, um, that we want some flexibility in making good decisions locally and, be, and we'll be responsible for it. And you're right, I was surprised there were dozens and dozens, I don't want to say a number because I might have it wrong, but dozens and dozens of school districts 
um, who had their local representatives um, on both aisles and both chambers yeah. file these bills. Um, and there's also a very large coalition of public education advocacy groups, the North Carolina School Board Association, NCAE, uh, Public School Forum, Public Schools First NC, NC Justice. Um, there's a lot uh, in North Carolina PTA, there's a lot of organizations who've said, give flexibility to the local school districts and let them do what's best. So sorry to interrupt there, but Wiley, please go on. And this and is the last important. one was, was yeah. a bill that I sponsored along with um, Representative Rachel Hunt in the House. Sort of nice to get to hear from Governor Hunt, who's Governor Hunt's daughter, um, about you know where where they were uh, with teacher assistance. This is this is a, a TA bill, um, and it would guarantee um, funding for for one TA in every classroom, kindergarten through second grade, still with funding for third grade as well. Um, and uh, you know the the main point of this is we've lost close to 10,000 you know TAs over the the past decade. And so if you you know you talk about the the teacher pipeline, you know having you know th this bill would have provided funding for just about 7,500 new new um, teacher assistants. And that certainly you you know you talk about the teacher pipeline that that's a great place to start. So we we certainly wanted to make the the point with this bill. We felt. You know, we didn't have any indication that it would go anywhere, and it, it didn't go anywhere. But this was, for for me, a, an especially important point. And Yvonne, I know you were you were there, you know, behind this bill as well, and with us, at, you know, when we when we had our press conference uh, and spoke on it. But um, you know, we we need to have one full time TA in every classroom. This is especially important for getting kids up to to grade level. Um, you know, for, for reading improvement. <laughs> and I will say that, you know, I have three children who graduated from the Wake County School System. And all of my three children, when they went through the Wake County School System, there was a TA in every class, K through five, K through five. And what we've been see, asking for now, and then we had it reduced to K through three. Um, and now, as you know, um, we do not, not have a TA for every uh, teacher in every class. Now, one of the things I have to point out, or I'd like to point out, is that some folks say, well, yeah, well, we, we reduce class size in the lower grades. We reduce class size in K1 and 2. And that is true. But what, um, what we have to keep in mind is that all of the research um, sh shows it's really the ratio of an adult to the, to the children. So while they reduce class size in, let's say, Mrs. Smith's second day grade class, now instead of having two adults in that class for 22 kids, right? That's one adult for every 11 kids. So you can have small reading groups and you can have individual instruction and uh, one group reading the bluebirds reading here and the redbirds reading there. So now we have 20 kids in the classroom or 19 kids in the classroom, but one adult. So just in terms of instruction, the research does not support that. I mean, it's yes, the teacher is the most important person in the classroom, but having a, a, a trained uh, teacher assistant in that classroom so the teacher can have individual instructions with reading has been shown time and time and time again by university researchers that that's, a, that's very effective. So. Um, I appreciate that this bill, the spirit of this bill has been introduced, and I hope that as we move into the next year that this will get a second look. So um, so now that kind of brings us to like, okay, we've talked about some things that uh, worked and some things that, that didn't go anywhere this year, but a lot of folks were asking me, you guys are coming back into town next week, what's been funded, what's still on the table? What's the most significant things that you know you can think of? Um, there are very a lot of confusion around who got a raise, who didn't get a raise, who needs a raise. Um, so maybe you could y'all could um, just kind of summarize that for the listening public here. Who actually got a raise this year in, in public education or in state government? The the state employees got raises um, they got five percent and uh, but that doesn't include um, post-secondary education so a lot of university you know, folks in our university system are, are still waiting um, but the big issue is k through 12. And that's what we're gonna we're gonna keep talking about okay 
the teachers did get you know their step raise um that was passed through a mini budget um bill but they didn't get any you know any additional raise other than those step raises so those what were is a step raise what is there an equivalency for a step raise is it like one percent or is it two percent do, do you happen to know i do not i don't uh, know off the top of my head I got that asked as a question, you know, what is a step raise worth? And I, and for some reason, I don't know that. I wanted to say it was 5%, but I don't know if that's correct. But that, now the that teaching seems assistant. Like a lot, but I could be wrong. I don't know. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was, it was, I think, I believe it was 15 and, and beyond. So 15 or 60, 16 to 20 was 500 a year, 21 to 24 was. 1,525 was 600. So that's less than a percent. I mean, that's yeah. really, that, that's, uh, yeah, somebody, I, I'm, I'm answering this for a question that's come in. So no, it was not equivalent to that. It was very, you know, it was in cash dollars, 500. So you can kind of do the percentage on the average teacher pay that that's well below that. And teacher assistance, as an example, got 1%. Uh, which again, you know, you're not making a livable wage. One percent is not much of that. Um, and so, what do you, what do you think are the most significant things uh, that you'll be doing when you come back? So it'll be around this budget, I guess. It's yeah, no, it, we're we're you know we're gonna be presented, I think, with with hopefully a, a compromise we can all support, or we're gonna have a a, a vote to override Governor Cooper's budget veto once more and um if it if if the his veto is overridden you know it, it was I, I guess you'd call it technically overridden in the house but i don't really even count that as an override truly um but but that's the vote um that we'll likely have and and um you know we'll, we'll i want to show you this chart i just put up a chart in the middle of all this i, I apologize to y'all but um this is a chart that a lot of teachers and a lot of uh, parent education education advocates talk to me about all the time. And they say, we really are behind the curve. When you look at what we were doing a decade ago, before the Great Recession, and now you look at what we're doing. And that this is one of their big complaints. Any comments on this? Or um, do you find this data correct? Yeah, yeah and, and I think we just have to keep framing the debate this way over and over and over, you know, every year, you know, teachers get more money from the legislature. They get some amount of a, of a raise, you know, each year, but it, it doesn't keep up with inflation. And if you look at the past, I mean, it's eight years, teacher pay is, it is, has gone down when you adjust for inflation. So, you know, it costs more to buy milk every year. And if you don't have, you know, enough money to meet that, your, your, the value of your dollar goes down. And we, I think we, we have to keep, Framing that issue is, you know, it, are we even just keeping up with inflation? I know from my law firm, I, I pay everybody enough. You know, if I'm not given a raise that's more than inflation, it's 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 a pay cut. Well, that's a really good point because, uh, you know, I even know a lot of uh, companies, when we look around North Carolina recently, some of the chamber were putting out information of what the average cost of living was and encouraging companies to do the same thing at least do cost of living at least do if you're not you know three percent if that's what it was or 2.4 or whatever it was but the uh the label statistics and from the federal and the state level are produced each year to show the um cost of living and so people are asking me where does this come from it comes from labor statistics and they estimate the cost of living and then we can certainly uh, calculate as we've done here what it was and what it is when you control for the cost of living or the inflation the in, the, that's gone up every year. And these are some other categories. We won't go into those, but you can see um, that we're, we're really falling behind in some of the classroom supplies, textbooks, materials, those kind of things. And look at the 35.6% the peer teacher assistance. That is um, something that bothers me the most um, as a a PTA member, I was PTA president 16 different times, Julie. And one of the things that I know is that what you know, not having a second set of hands in the classroom so a teacher can go to the bathroom, so a teacher can have small classes, so a teacher can 
um, do some research so a teacher can grade some papers. Whatever it is, is really incredible. So this is a startling thing. I don't think a lot of parent people understand. Well, look, right, one thing I want to make sure we save a few minutes for and talk about is something that happened right before the holiday break and the Leandro case um, got big news. Um, as y'all know that this was a, a lawsuit that was filed um, in 1994 and it involved, uh, I won't read all of this, but I hope that later, if you did not catch, if you're listening in now, I hope you'll go back later and listen again and read some of these slides. So I'll leave it up there long enough for our audience to read it. But this is a long running court case, basically saying that North Carolina was not providing a sound basic um, education to our children and it wasn't doing it in an equal way. If you think about this, one of the things I like to talk about is in 1840, the first public school opened in North Carolina, 180 years ago. And in our constitution in North Carolina, we should be very proud that unlike we, unlike many states, have actually put in our state constitution that we want every child to get a free, high quality education. So based on that, um, some folks sued saying um, that we were not doing that for some of our kids. Um, and then the ruling came through and now we have spent, um, since the ruling in 2002, I think you would agree with me that we've spent a, a decade or two now haggling, arguing um, about what to do about it. We've found that um, we do have, we, the courts have said, yes, our kids have an, a right to this opportunity. And the courts were, the state was told to remedy. And I'm not an attorney, you two attorneys know what that word means, remedy, make whole, I guess, or make right to fix. And it, it hasn't really happened. Um, so now uh, here we are, um, last year, there was a, uh, the um, plaintiffs agreed to, um, uh, to ask the courts to appoint an independent research group. And Judge Lee has, I mean, that was done. Judge Lee, uh, David Lee, has been responsible for looking at the study. They hired a company called West Ed uh, last, oh, I guess, March of 2018. And this past March, a year later, they submitted their recommendations to uh, Judge David Lee. So a lot of folks have been waiting, waiting, waiting for those results to be let by the court. So it was pretty exciting. Um, I, I, for you know, wonks like me, I was very excited and that the report was finally um, released. And I think Julie is at about 300 pages. Yeah. Um, this report. So this is uh, if you haven't seen it, audience, please go to you know, search on the internet, West Ed Report. If you go to Public Schools First, our website, we have a tab across the top. We have a page dedicated to this. Our, our newsletter each week started last week and we're doing it again this week. We're going through each week and doing another one of the issues around Leandro to unpack it, to make people understand. This is perhaps one of the key um, things that we have had in public education to help us document independently what needs to be done to make sure that every child has an equal access to public education. So these two findings, everybody would look at that one second and I'll ask our guests to talk a little bit about how they see this report. But two major goals of the Leandro decision I think are important to talk about for just a second increasing proficiency rates of our students, especially at-risk students, and increasing the preparation of our students, especially, again, at-risk students, to be successful outside of, of K-12. So these were kind of the things that they were looking at. And then, and then I wanted to put up here the major recommendations that came out of the study last week. And Julie and Wally, if you'd like to speak to any of this or summarize it, I'll let our audience see it with you. Um, please feel free. My dog is making noise. Sorry. <laughs> okay. She wants to be involved in the in the webinar. Um, I'll just I'll, I'll start by just saying that um, 
you know, I think that the Leander report, I hope will be a roadmap for the legislature, you know, over the next few years. Um, obviously, it's going to take a lot of money and a lot of resources to do a lot of these things, but I think they can be done. We've already started working on some of these things, especially the, the first, oh, can you go back? Sorry, Yvonne. Okay. Um, the first, the first um, bullet point there as far as revising our state funding model, um, the legislature has already started some, you know, committee meetings, and I think they've been doing some um, examination of our state funding model, and I think that that is the number one thing that we need to do. Personally, that's my opinion here in North Carolina is to revise how we fund schools because right now it's just not cutting it. Um, we're leaving so many of our schools behind because of the way that our local funding is having to supplement. And that's a result of underfunding, of course, and some of our local districts have had to step up. Um, but if you really look at how that's created, you know, a, a state of haves and have nots, and it's very, very stark when you look at, um, those local funding supplements across our state. And so by revising, you know, how we do that to make sure that we're funding equitably, not equally, but equitably across our state, then that is going to really improve, you know, giving the resources to those at-risk kids that were mentioned in the in the report. The other thing I just wanted to mention is, um, you know, that we've already, tried to file bills and tried to get more funding for pre-k i think that there's a big um there's been a lot more push in the last few years and a lot of more scientific you know findings the legislature loves data and they want to know if their money is going to be put in the right place and governor cooper and and the north carolina department of health and human services has a a great new report on early education um, a, a model, you know, for our state around early education and, and early childhood. And it includes, you know, giving the opportunity for every four-year-old to attend pre-K, but we really need to think about early education and early childhood way earlier, you know, even starting with prenatal care and how prenatal care and, and, and healthy babies result in healthy students and healthy adults. So we have to really, it's a its a huge um, push and a huge um, project, but I think it's well worth our time. The third thing I'll just mention real quickly is, um, you know, I think one of the, um, or the second bullet point here around diverse teaching staff, I was just able to attend the DRIVE Summit at North Carolina State University, which was bringing together people all over the state to talk about how our teaching um, staff in the state is not diverse and how having diverse teaching staff benefits all students, not just minority students, benefits all students. And right now, over 50% of our population in North Carolina is, a, is in the minority population. So they're not really a minority anymore, but but only 20% of our teachers are uh, of color or of a minority status. So that's a big issue. And I think it's something, obviously the Leandro report mentioned that because it's important to improving, you know, our public schools here in our state. Yeah, and I think with the Leandro, you know, um, funding education, it's not up for debate. It's protected by the by the Constitution and in the courts, you know, will continue to step in if they need to. And we're 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 42nd in funding per student, you know, as a state. Uh, so we're at the bottom of the barrel there. And you know, I see it, you know, when I visit all the schools in my district, you go to, you know, kindergarten or first grade, and and you don't see a TA in every classroom. I I haven't actually I've I've been to 22 schools uh, since I got elected in my district, and I haven't seen a single nurse. Uh, in this school I've visited yet. So you have nurses that are doing two, three, four schools, you know, so we ought to have that. We ought to have, you know, a significant, I, I think we should have universal pre-K, but but um, those are the things that, you know, this report, you know, talks about and, and the numbers that, you know, they they say $8 billion over eight years. So we, we need to, you know, provide the the, the resources for our, our teachers and our students and our schools. And that's going to be the big debate that we're going to have to keep having every, Every, every year until you know until we can you know meet the meet the promise of Leandro
Well, now, one of the things I want to point out um, in this slide, if you guys would look at it with me, um, is that this is straight out of the Land Re Report. Um, and the Land Re Report, the, the West Ed Report, excuse me, um, is an independent consulting group from California. Um, there's also uh, folks on both sides of the issues who've been on the Oversight Committee working with West Ed for the past year. And these are their basic findings about what it would take to meet the requirements. And I, you, you touched on that, Wiley, and there it is. Individual students, $589 per student that we're underfunding right now. And, and for a total of $6.8 billion that we have to spend over the next eight years. And when you think about our state, and you guys correct me, but we, are, we do our budget every two years, correct? So we did our budget last year. So when you think about the next eight years, um, you know, almost a decade. And for many children, they'll be out of our school system by then. We've lost opportunities for these children. But it, even putting that out over the next eight years is, is ambitious. But can we do it? Is there a way to do it? Um, you know, how, how would, where do we need to start first? Well, you know, <laughs> we, we certainly, you know, I think, I think there's plenty of money and, and we need to make those investments. Um, you know, we, we, uh, we have by far the lowest taxes in the South for corporate taxes, for individual tax, we have a flat tax rate. And those are the things that, you know, we need to look at. Um, but, but there's, you know, we, we need to find the revenue and, and it's, it's certainly there. So I think that's, you know, on a, you know, a big level, um, what we need to be focused on in the legislature is providing funding so that we're not 42nd in, in spending per student. And, you know, I, I think Leandro has a lot of great ways that we can get there. Well, you know, I, I would, you know, I follow very much. I, um, I subscribe and listen and look at a lot of the chamber reports from the North Carolina chamber and the national chamber. And I'm very interested always in, in what business is thinking about and what they're talking about and what they're saying. And the one thing that um, I, I find some encouragement in, and while there's some of their reform ideas about schools I don't agree with, what I do see and do agree with is that they're constantly talking about wanting to invest in training students so they can go to college or go to work and do the job. They are always talking about workforce development they um, are very supportive of putting money into um, having high quality teachers and principals leading our schools. So I, it seems like we do have um, some support out there in the business community. Um, and we certainly have support with a lot of parents and a lot of educators. Um, and I'm really excited about this report. I, we have been talking about it for um, literally you know, I feel like the whole time my children were in school, you know, the whole time I, ch I had all three of my children graduated from high school and we were still arguing about Leandro. And my children did go to Wake County, which means that they did have a better opportunity to have better paid teachers and better qualified teachers. And all their teachers had master's degrees and national board certifications almost exclusively, all the way, all the way through K through 12. Um, and so I, uh, but I, I think that one of the messages that that uh, we believe in and public schools first is that um, every child deserves the same opportunities. Every child needs to be able to contribute and be a productive member of society, contribute to, uh, and work, contribute taxes, support our community. So it's really disheartening to see so many of these counties. This lawsuit came together because so many of the poor counties were so inadequately funded. And Julie, you pointed that out earlier. They, the, in terms of who they can attract, um, who can uh, they pay, who can they keep, and so that's really uh, terrible to me. But I'm very excited. We have now a new judge. Uh, Howard Manning uh, did a lot of work, a good work for the state of North Carolina. Um, he's retired now. Um, we're, we're very hopeful that any time now that Judge David Lee will come out and talk about what he's going to do. Because there's two ways we get this funding. Is this correct? Um, one is that the legislature can voluntarily start allocating funds to meet some of these goals. The second is that the courts could order the state to 
allocate the funds. Is that, is that correct, what I'm saying? Yeah, I was. I heard somebody, I don't know, it was a podcast or somebody talking about this and how, you know, a court ordering the legislature to do something, you know, like that, I mean, could cross into, you know, uh, whether one branch of the government can order, you know, us to do, to appropriate money. I could see there being kind of a big battle over that, you know, because that's the legislature's job, not the court's job. So, We'll see how that all plays out, but I hope that the legislature will agree to do it without having to get into a big court battle over it. But but courts do that. I mean, in California, they, they weren't they weren't providing adequate funding for prison the prison system, so the courts had to step in and say, you know, you you have to have adequate funding for your prisons. You know, and this this session, you know, we've had the courts step in and tell us to redraw unconstitutional gerrymandered maps. So, you know, it's becoming more and more of a thing. <laughs> I think, and oh, I'm hopeful. We, I'm hopeful they won't have to. I'm hopeful we can we can do the right thing for our kids. But um, I'm with Julie. I'm hoping that we don't. But but I would say that I think that if Judge David Lee uh, and I I have found to this point of, as an observer outside the system looking in that he's been very fair, and I think that we have a great report, um, and I think that we have a lot of people in the General Assembly from rural counties as well as urban counties and both sides of the aisle who really do, were waiting for this information to have an independent study so that it would not be about politics but about children and what is needed for kids. So I'm excited, it's here. I'm hoping that we can get aligned with these requirements. I'm hoping like Julie that we can come in as a elected bodies representing all the citizens and say, let's start making some steps forward um, in fixing that. And some of those things are what y'all have been saying, right? Like how do you improve these children's uh, at-risk children? They have to have teacher assistance. They have to have literacy coaches. They have to have some wraparound services where they're getting mental health services in school to deal with some of the things that are going on. They have to have health care and mental health care. So a lot of the things that are in this report really go back to sometimes y'all, what I call some common sense, right? Kids that are homeless, kids that aren't eating every day, kids that are coming to school tired or don't have a place to live, kids that aren't getting the help they need or their families are dealing with, you know, the stress of, of um, uh, uh, abusive situations, domestic violence or drugs and alcohol in the home. We know we have a lot of kids who are at risk. We also know that independent of all those things, our teens right now have the second leading cause of teen death. And really it's more than that, it's 10 to 17, is suicide. And many of these children are not facing some of those adverse childhood experiences I said to you, but they're facing bullying and racism and sexism and the stress and anxiety of a social media world, right? So I'm hoping that the General Assembly is gonna come back, read this report, take it serious, and start doing what's necessary to give every child a high quality free public education. Um, I want to just say before we end, I want to see if there's any other questions uh, that, that are hanging around out here. Um, let me see. I've been stopping and asking you the questions as we've gone along. Um, and I think I've pretty much in my little chat box here have answered most of them. Um, and here's kind of one that I might use to kind of summarize things. Someone said, um, what are your, your top two goals individually for the, the rest of this session. And then the second question is not related, but kind of I'll throw it out there. Someone saying, so when is the long session over and when does the short session start? And so I don't know how to answer that one. So I will, uh, so let's answer that one first. When is the long session over and when does the short session start, y'all? I, I mean, technically I think we're, this this session next week is a continuation of the long session right. we just recessed for the holidays but it's my understanding that this would still be considered part of the long session um like nobody really like it doesn't really matter we're just there <laughs> i mean i think that you know but my understanding is as if we are there next week for a couple of days and then we recess again, maybe it will be until about May. That's usually traditionally when the short session starts. And traditionally that lasts, Wiley, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is six to eight weeks. 
but yeah, I mean, I signed, know, I signed up for for six months every two years and six weeks the next yeah. year. So it, it, it's been, it's been pretty constant. But as so we know, that doesn't always happen. Ever. So we, we, it's it's anybody's guess. So. Okay, so you're you just have a year round session now. I guess maybe that's yeah. it. Maybe we're, maybe we won't notice when one birthday ended and one started. I don't know because it's a year long thing. Okay, so let's go back and get, give each of you a chance to finish up with uh, kind of what your personal uh, goals are for this uh, this next round of meetings, I'll call them that, and long session meetings. Um, what are the maybe one or two things, Julie and Wally, that you see um, that you're going to be working on really hard or you really care about or um, any any comments you'd like to make to the to the public? I mean, I can just start the, the two things I, I really, really hope we can we can we can pass, um, you know, and, and there's tons of bipartisan support all over the place for these two things. Big priorities for me. Number one, Medicaid expansion. You know, th this is something that is so important on so many levels for our economy um, and, and our state. And then number two, um, independent redistricting reform. You know, I think we, we need to have this on the ballot to just end the way we draw our maps that that touches on so much of this. If you know, for folks listening, you know, you, you want to have a, a legislature that that reflects everybody in the state, you know, having fair maps and getting it out of politicians' hands, I think is, is a very important goal for, for for everybody. And and there's tons of support on both sides of the aisle for these things and they just haven't happened yet. So those are those are things I, I I'm hopeful. You know, I, I don't know if we'll get there, but but those are my priorities. Okay, Julie. Well, as far as for education, I mean, I think that we need to get teachers a raise, um, you know, not just these paltry step raises, but we need to keep working toward that goal. I think everybody at the legislature wants them to get a raise. It's not that we're all, you know, sitting around saying, no, they're not going to get one. It's just figuring out how much that's going to be in compromising. And I wish there would be a little bit more of that um, in the legislature, which there hasn't been a lot of that this session. Um, you know, and as far as that would also include that $15 minimum wage for our non-certified employees. I think that's, it needs to go hand in hand with teacher raises. We can't just look at teachers and not everybody else. So I think that that, those two things would be, I think, a huge step and toward, you know, um, just having a little bit more, you know, um, positivity in our public schools. I mean, I, I just wanted to add one thing when we were talking about teacher assistance and, you know, the one thing that you hear a lot about is, oh, teachers just want to raise, I just want to raise, I want more money, you know, they, they went into teaching, they knew it didn't pay a lot, but really when I talk to teachers and what I hear from teachers is a lot of their, you know, the reason that they're struggling, I think, is really around working conditions. It's not always about their how much they get paid. And we need to really look at what their working conditions is. And that really includes those teacher assistants and giving them the half an hour off that they need to take a lunch break. You know, right now they don't get that a lot of times, mm -hmm. which is just sad. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to look at, you know, the, the working conditions for teachers, whether that includes, you know, paying teacher assistants or, you know, getting those mental health professionals in the school, making them feel safer in their schools, you know, whatever it is. Um, so we can't just concentrate on money. We need to think about those working conditions as well. I think that it's really, um, thank you so much for pointing that out because when you look at the um, things that they, they have, uh, resolutions that the NCAE, for example, has passed, you look at their things they've asked for, the bills they've pushed, um, you know, eight out of 10 have nothing to do with pay. Uh, they have all to do with caring about children and wanting to give children the best opportunity they can. Teachers want to be successful, just like all of us in our careers. Um, in our family, we want to be successful, and teachers want our kids to be successful. Um, and so, I really appreciate that you saying that because I think that's just critically important to know that what we're asking for most of the time. And I listen to teachers exactly what you're saying. They want the environment, the school environment, to be the very best it can for their kids. Um, they want great principals. They want great nurses. They want social workers in the school to help kids deal with the stresses. Um, they they want to make sure we don't have uh, bus drivers driving triple routes because in, in tired. They want to make sure that there's um, someone um, in the teacher in the room to help. So thank you so much for saying that. Well, our time has come to an end, and unfortunately, we I'm going to have to say goodbye because I really 
think that you uh, have done a great job. I really appreciate this update. Um, like I said, we invited several people to come. You guys were game and that shows your dedication to you know, your positions and your community. Um, I love that, that both of you are such strong public education advocates. Um, so happy new year. 2020 happy is year. here. Um, and thank you again for sharing this information with us tonight. And um, Julie, one thing, someone just popped up and said, you mentioned a governor's report on universal pre-K. Um, do you know where we would find that at? Or could you send that to me and I'll post it on Public Schools First? Yeah, definitely. I think it's on the North, the DHHS website, NCDHHS, but I think they have a dedicated um, website and I would be happy to send that to you. Okay. Okay. Because that sounds really good. And in the follow-up comment this person made, they don't want you to go either. We're getting questions here now. Stay on the line <laughs> um, is about, um, you know, that we are in a state right now, like many states where we do have a declining school enrollment the last couple of years overall. It slowed down a little bit. And they're saying, isn't this a great opportunity for public schools to offer pre-K in the school setting where we'd have certified teachers, we'd have accountability with funding, and the, the kids would be in buildings we're already using. I don't know if you have a comment about that. Um, we've talked about some um, small school districts and even in Charlotte where they've closed some schools for under enrollment. Would this be a great opportunity for citizens to see their money maximized by using buildings we already have um, to uh, bring in pre-K rooms or teachers. And that might be true in some districts. I mean, I know, you know, when we were going through the class size mandate, you know, when we were lowering class sizes, you know, there's some districts who are struggling to find space. So I think it would really depend on the school district. But when we think about that, we also have to, you know, think about, um, paying, you know, because early education or early childhood educators are one of the most lowest paid educators in the state. And so recruiting those those educators in some of those districts, you know, out in our rural areas is also difficult. We also have to think about how to get those kids there and, you know, to the school. That's always a big issue, you know, with, um, you know, if kids don't have transportation or whatever to get them there. So there, there's a lot of challenges. I mean, I well, think that there are opportunities. Yeah, there's no easy answer is the answer that our friends out there, <laughs> our audience. But this is a complicated issue, but the goal is to make sure that we're at least serving all the at-risk kids who are on the waiting list for, for pre-K and hopefully looking for ways working with private industry, um, community groups, church groups, and so forth, we can see an expansion of pre-K um, for all children across the state, not just those who can afford it. So that's really important. And that's a great note to end on that all of these things are very complicated. To all of you who've tuned in tonight, thank you so much for spending your time with us. Um, I will give you the, the, you know, the drill that everybody says at the end of presentation. Uh, we've already done our questions, but really thank you for coming on tonight. Go to Public Schools First Facebook page, like our page, it really um, matters to our grant folks. Um, you know, follow us on Twitter and please, please contact us with your questions and your thoughts and your suggestions. But, you know, if you don't get our newsletter, you need to get our newsletter. It is great. It comes out basically every week. I have a lot of information over the next two months over the Leandro case. And I think you'll find that interesting. And it's a great way to kind of keep track of what's going on, what bills pass, what don't pass. We do a legislative update every week. And we'll be coming back. Um, uh, we, this has been so successful and so many folks have participated. We may have to come invite you guys back. Let's um, do it. The session ever ends. And, <laughs> and uh, we might invite you back to talk about the short session um, and what's coming up. All right. So good night, friends. And thank you all for joining us. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night.